Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching. This video is fifth and last in the series of five presenting a note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Das Rheingold Scene 1. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly analysis, its massive journey aspires to scan the entirety of Der Ring des Nibelungen to its final note. I hope you'll take this voyage with me, one I've dedicated all my energies to complete. For an explanation of who I am, and more on the reasons for this series, please check out my preface video. Its link is supplied below, along with those for the videos preceding this one. We pick up where we left off on the top stave of page 65 in Dover's full score, just as Voglinda prepares to make her baleful announcement, tragically revealing how to steal the gold and forge the ring. One of the most telling aspects of this sequence is its shift into duple time, the epic's first instance of that meter. The nymph twice repeats a morphine, first dub renunciation of love by Volzogen, no doubt in deference to opera and drama since Der Minnemacht and Sagt are the words first heard with it. His musical example reproduces Voglinda's entire vocal while bracketing only a portion as the morpheme in question. Kobe accepts Volzogen's name and cites it without brackets or lyrics. This moniker is well established by Newman's time, and his example includes both its initial cells with words and harmony, a practice followed by Hutchison and Cook. Holman accepts the title and gives both iterations, but without words. Dunnington reduces the moniker to renunciation, while Lee favors the pragmatic moment of choice. Alone among these, Sabor never identifies this pivotal morpheme. Rather, he confuses it with one which, in scene two, develops out of renunciation. This later evolution he dubs Liebe Tragique citing it throughout his commentary in place of the actual renunciation morpheme. Such a varied wealth of monikers apparently mean to reconcile this first appearance with the morpheme's later and more troublesome associations, mysteries I'll address as they occur. In the meantime, renunciation of love, which I usually shorten to renunciation, seems to most accurately describe this syntax's overall import. Of this key moment in the drama, presumably speaking for the Meister, Portia says, Voglinde is der instrument of a higher power. The vitally important melody she is singing must have the chiseled quality of a piece of sculpture. The orchestration is accordingly solemn, bringing in low brass for the first time since the prelude. As befits the distortion of nature's energies represented by the morpheme, the ash interval sounds in its equivocal low module, on a pathetic minor sixth. While here its syncopation is masked as two even quavers, beginning with its scene one two interlude reprise, the morpheme almost invariably sounds with the ash interval intact. For now, it's a flaccid echo of the Rheingold itself, leading to reverse melody notes, the morpheme's backbone, a cell which has already established an appreciable role in both the vocal lines and orchestral accompaniment of this first of the epic scenes, whose sexual racial tensions bubble just beneath its surface. When this cell mutates in Siegfried, intimations of race and sexual power dominate its associations. Consistent with the Tetralogy's musical narrative logic, the two renunciation pulses are supported by three consecutive iterations of the Erdachords, though each of Voglinda's melody strophes end ironically on that fundamental syntax's reverse notes. She goes on by saying this dire act imparts the Zalba necessary to forge the ring, her vocal a rising air to fourth, a static ash interval to move nervously through a pair of low intervals, on first a minor then a major third, a progression which underlines the primal source of this magic's equivocal potency. This portion of Voglinda's vocal bundle also comprises a series of distinctive up-down leaps of a third, another detail which only shows its hand late in Rheingold. 
Rounding this mystic element of Voglinda's vocal, low strings snake up a chromatic scale, answered by a swifter one on a clarinet and English horn. Loge and his sexual energy are key to this dire transformation of the pure gold, as this analysis maintains he must be. Triggered by the forswearing of love, his fire magic empowers the renouncer's sexual frustration to create the ring. Emphasized as the nymph finishes her revelation with the ring morpheme proper, in virtually its definitive form, a plunging diminished minor seventh arpeggio followed by melody notes, which, for emphasis, clarinets double, harmonized in thirds. Along with a wrenching shift back to triple time, first violins shatter this pivotal moment's intensity with two puckish nibelung-like grace notes resembling little sneers, then roguishly underscore the nymph's following byplay with a series of waves, finished by varied triplet turn modules on second violins, as the maidens agree an amorous dwarf poses no threat to the gold. Velgunde sings first, leaping up a fifth to oppose reverse melody notes, backbone of renunciation, with its original, producing both a crib on the nymph's joy and Alberich's frustrated wooing, while also suggesting the giant turn with its growing sense of interracial breeding. The fundamental source of all these turns, of course, lies in the Rheingold prelude. She ends her phrase with that falling triad from the primal lullaby tune, which has also begun to acquire a sense of the Nibelung's frustrated urge to procreate, only just reinforced in the ring by the words Welt Erbe. Unaware she's giving herself the lie, Velgund expands her phrase after a quaver pause with a reassuring melody note strophe, making her phrase a distorted crib of the ring. She caps this, rising a third into an expressive pair of chord notes which add up to the extended reverse melody notes, a rising falling sign itself gathering syntactic importance. Then, after a quaver rest, she concludes with another ring crib, tailed out by a gentle falling seventh on the word minna, another soft reminder of Erda's world-spanning influence. Overall, her wording closely foreshadows Loges and is seen to panegyric to nature. Fas nur lebt will lieben, meiden will keiner die Minne. Yet another hint, the fire god is their father, the one who's given them this insight. Voglinda steps in to emphasize the lack of threat Albrecht poses, beginning with myopic irony on a reverse chord note opposition, ended by an inverted ash interval, direst of those world ash cells, and a fourth ascent. After a crotchet rest, she lifts on extended melody notes, then, after a dotted crotchet pause and two static notes a half-tone above, plunges a fifth to rise a third on the word Liebesgier, an intervallic reversal of the dwarf's own version which embraces the mix of passion and defeat implied by the nymph's words. She rounds off her sideways taunt by falling a third into another melody note lift, echoing the first to produce a reverberation of Alberich's wooing as well as the nymph's joy. Though an audience is unlikely to perceive it, the orchestral accompaniment reveals Wagner's internal syntactic thought processes. The viola line is especially revealing as it moves through the embryonic ring's second half, inverting its falling triads to slide down extended reverse melody notes into a series of Welt Erb triads leavened with heroic melody note inversions. With the second measure of Voglinda's retort, cellos initiate a series of pizzicato octave pulses which slyly hark back to Alberich's entrance. Flosselda chimes in with her own lack of concern to a high ash interval on a rising air to fourth, capped after falling a fifth, and chord notes with extended melody notes, the sort of equivocal optimism which reverberates through this passage in all three of the nymph's vocals. To covertly emphasize the mistake they're making, cellos rise an extra octave as she chimes in, only to fall two of them on her static pulses singing Nicht Fürcht. 
Meanwhile, as her phrase proceeds, violas rise forth into a pair of reverse melody notes capped by a last Welt Erb triad, both modules redolent with Albrecht's nascent sexual drive. She goes on with yet another melody note pulse, this time hyperextended, to remark, Seine Minne brunst brannte fast mich ended on a figure halfway between one of the lullaby's signature cells and Albrecht's own frustrated lament. In so doing, she inspires a virtually wordless measure, viola sweeping aside the wave forms with hectic triplets strung in violin twists, low strings winding a tortured chromatic sine wave in semiquavers, a succinct portrait of the dwarf overcome by fulminating lust. The waves return with the next measure as Velgunde vocally expands this fire-lust metaphor, rising a sixth into an even more precise ring strophe, its only variance being its triad replaced by heroic melody notes in retrograde, and extended melody notes become hyper-extended. After a quaver rest, she goes on with taunting up-down leaps, a sixth, third, fourth, and, after her last quaver rest, another third, to end on chord notes. These last two cells, already briefly heard in scene one, form a module which, in scene two, acquires connotations flipping the present lyric's import on its head. This inspires Viola's violins to a climactic upward movement on semiquaver chromatic scales, even with trillopagaturas underpinned by one on cellos that fills the entire measure. This bouquet of sexual excitements triggers the scene's final concerted number, along with a key change to E major. Tactically speaking, it's a monumentally ill-advised taunting, which, though briefer than the first, both echoes and varies it. The nymphs begin with the wanted three of its rising triad figures, a subtle hint the dwarf must abandon all hope of mating with them, while a truncated flute clarinet iteration of the lullaby melody mixes with two first violin viola wave pulses. Second violins add sexual heat to the syntactic bundle with a trill apogitura, then pass it to woodwinds and horns that pulse it throughout as they exchange it with varied canonic echoes of the nymph's vocal modules. Along with them, the violin choir trades wave pairs with pizzicato falling octaves, reinforced by violas, a sinister reminder of the dwarf's presence. The maiden's vocal continues atop this mix with a half-speed version of their prior ensemble, followed after a minim rest by another of its modules to move into a leisurely variant of still a third, altering its bounce on a third by falling on reverse melody notes, only to complete the cell as before, meaning with the second reverse melody note strophe. Their words... In des Golde Scheine wie leuchtest du schön, are not only a backhanded jibe at his ugliness, but also an ironic syntactic hint of what becomes of the dwarf and his nibelung fellows once they're the only things lit by the gold. Following it with another ensemble pulse, its final phrase being genuine melody notes, this call for him to join in their revels thus includes a syntactic implication he might yet avoid the doom towards which his sexual frustration impels him. The nymphs finish very much as they do to conclude their two previous ensembles, yet their subtle variants have major syntactic impact. Moving into the ensemble's climax, they return to a pair of iterations of that cell which generates the turn in the Nibelung tattoo, the first in major mode, the second minor, then back to major for the passage's climax, ere does dusk having again shaded their joyful light. Notable, however, is its initial drop on a sixth, and not its wanted third, a seemingly trivial detail which contributes to another evolving morpheme, a crystallization of the dwarf's own ill-fated wooing, whose impact spreads across the tetralogy once it solidifies in scene three and four, here shifting the passage from E major to C major, as a brilliant trumpet Rheingold Tattoo underscores the line's more fixed, embryonic version of the Nibelung Tattoo. 
It's constructed from a long, short, long pulse, in effect a static ash interval, and the nymph's characteristic turn comprised of melody notes, an evolution from their previous elation, whose next step in Loge's scene two panegyric to nature is recognized by Volzogen, Kobe, Cook, and Sabor. Creating another variant, their cry ends on that turn which is so prominent in their initial teasing ensemble, here completed by the first inversion heroic melody notes. Overall, the nymph's lyrics only enrage Alberic the more, who hail him as Lieblichte Alba, then tell him he's handsome only in the gold's light. In doing so, they complete the fire god's work by inflaming in their victim the bitter heights of resentful frustration necessary for the renunciation of love. Falling silent, the maidens cavort wordlessly, as embellished by piccolo trill appoggiaturas, woodwinds' horns ecstatically repeat the maiden's initial joy whole, with a second pulse of its inner portions for good measure, while low strings thump away, first in triplets, then graced crotchet strokes, reinforced by a long, short, long pulse on horns' timpani. Through it all, violins, violas begin by sounding two measures of waves, first violins taking the next two as seconds, violas switch to trills, a complex that for the following two measures is handled by seconds, trading with violas as firsts produce a trill appoggiatura. Lest this be dismissed as mere padding, it's the proverbial last straw, the passage which determines Alberich to abandon all hope of love, now he knows how and with what to replace it. The trumpet's long-held final Rheingold fanfare note ceases after seven measures, as horns lapse into a pedal and timpani trade their pulsing for a long, ominously subdued roll, three times punctuated every other measure by a cymbal stroke, a thumping octavo pizzicato in low strings on the first beat of each measure. Simultaneously, violas sound a final trill appoggiatura, while first violins intone a pair of truncated wave pulses. Thus grounded, flutes, clarinets, horns bounce on a genial major mode ring iteration, as first presented by Velgunde, meaning with its melody note opposition, concluded with that bounce which also intimates Alberich's stubborn lust. All this underscores the silent dwarf, the Augen star auf das Gold gerichtet. Once first violins pass their wave to seconds, still in major mode, oboe clarinet bassoons ease a second ring pulse into slightly darker harmonic territory, its initial descent outlining a harmonic seventh with its wonted overlapping triads, again completed by melody notes and nymph-like bounce, its lusting echo here rising on an air to fourth. This triggers a third ring iteration, its triads descending from major into the syntax's more usual bleak minor, its rising melody notes separated from its triadic descent by the syntax's more wonted lift of a third, to conclude in a ghost of its original bounce, a lone ringlust cell whose ascent of a fifth characterizes the morpheme from this point forward. The dwarf's vocal musing begins with his third pulse, as he leaps up a sixth into its initial falling triad on the words Der Welt Erbe, his following line a rough double of the morpheme's contour to words this analysis holds are the key to its overall meaning. He says nothing of the ring itself, but only festers over his bitter disappointment. What's nowhere in the dwarf's mind when he first encounters the Rhine Maidens is now disastrously seeded in it by their cruelty. A fourth and last ring pulse follows in virtually its definitive form, and darker still on bassoon's violas, as he sings the Maidens' abandoning upward triad, a plaintive downward sixth on the word Liebe, and a powerfully climaxing scale which renders the melody notes in their hyper-extended version to pull the morphine's orchestral doubling along with him. Committed to the allegorical school inherited from Bernard Shaw, tradition looks on the ring as no more than a greed metaphor, yet the essential mindset for stealing the Rheingold and forging the ring is Alberich's psychological-emotional shift. 
he is experiencing a profound change of heart. He is no longer in the clutches of a tormenting passion, but is taking a decision that is the product of his own personal will. Albrecht's words say nothing of riches. He doesn't want the gold for itself, but only its specific power to control sexuality. Purely in terms of the narrative as written, this isn't a lust for wealth, but a will to ruthless rule through racial means, meaning as empowered by sexual reproduction. Then Nibelung wants to conquer the Rhine Maidens physically, to dominate their bodies sexually, the world's body along with theirs. Welterbe. Stealing their gold being the only way to achieve that goal, his theft is rape, as the Meister's original title for Rheingold attests, a sexually consummated power crime. Albrecht's last words, as quoted above, trigger a single dire pulse of renunciation in one lone measure of duple time, meaning without its initial cell, thus lacking its low world ash interval trigger, which thrusts the emphasis on its reverse melody notes with their nascent sexual racial implications. A petal on low brasses, a choir absent from the texture since that morphine's first appearance, inject a single deeply tragic sonic memory of its original statement's erda chords, horns, tremolo violins, violas, and arco cellos doubling the melody. Their reverse chord notes lead back to triple time, and breathless violin, viola, cello, fingered tremolos over a low brass pedal, what Lee calls the dwarf's moment of choice. Three strident oboes bray a harsh, nibelung-like tattoo to announce Albrecht's pivotal threat, the first time he refers to himself as a nibelung. Per the score, first bar laut, he begins on a static ash interval to echo the oboe tattoo from which he plunges a sixth. After a quaver rest, he resumes a third above to lift another third. Thus sketch a rising triad replete with its sense of abandonment. To fall a tritone only to sketch another rising triad, the sequence a raging echo of the Rhine Maiden's tauntings. From its top note, he sinks a third to end on an upward fifth, mark of his stubborn lust now centered on forging the ring. A second brutal oboe tattoo settles on a horn bassoon pedal chord in diminished minor seventh harmony as strings rush up two measures of semiquaver arpeggios, shapes that twist back on themselves to reverse his earlier scramble, implying the dwarf's clamber towards the gold will be a greater success than was his ineffectual wooing. The nymphs don't grasp this as a serious assault, but instead wildly mock his approach on a duo of Velgunda's seductive cell, meaning with their world-ash implication shattered followed by a broad version of their joy, making it resemble the dwarf's passion. Another pair of joy distortions, a lullaby pulse, and an exact joy strophe. Their voices approach climax on a broadly expanded ring cell, similar to their first salutes to the gold, answered by a shrill woodwind echo to end with laughter on their taunting module, again echoed by woodwind. Throughout this passage, fierce violin, viola, wave inversions, peppered with trill appoggiaturas, depict the dwarf's climb, here invested by ring and other key syntax with a major impact on future morphemic and associative evolutions. It begins with its most important material. Supporting Velgunda's seductive modules, violins, violas, plunge down arpeggio chains, both aping and distorting the ring's first half, while cellos answer on modules rising as in its embryonic second portion, rhythmically stressing its triad. Under the nymph's following vocal, these patterns shift to plunging first violin arpeggios, underlain by second violin viola trill appoggiaturas, while cellos saw away at loge-like fingered tremolos, supported by contrabasses at the octave below. This stresses the dwarf's sexual agitation, while the almost imperceptible chord notes which conclude the second set of ring fragments look forward in a surprising way to the outcome of his approaching theft. 
In the following two measures, as the Rhine Maidens sing hectic lullaby joy variants, the ring module in first violins turns back on itself in reverse chord notes, immediately echoed in seconds. For the next three measures, these expand into pairs of long arpeggios, the nymphs crying a truncated ring on the first measure echoed in woodwinds on the second, while cellos contrabasses roll back and forth on rising falling octaves with all their implied ambivalence. On the third measure, in answer to the maiden's final laugh, the episode climaxes on a single measure of violins, violas, racing down, up, a ring-like sign. As woodwind shriek the nymph's laughter variant, its final notes begun on octavo low strings, then joined by woodwinds ascending through an elongation of the embryonic ring's rising arpeggio, meaning a chain of abandonment triads. The sting at its crest, across all instruments currently in play, banishes the chaos with a shift to 9-8 meter, leaving only the tense undercurrent of a second violin viola fingered tremolo pedal, as the dwarf condemns the Rhine Maidens to bult in darkness. His line apes their own joy, then rises in two low ash intervals on reverse chord notes, the first terminated after rising a third by the chord notes themselves, after a crotchet rest, the second extending into melody notes. As per the stage instruction, er streckt die Hand nach dem Goldhaus, and the clamorous orchestral response injects a pivotal wrinkle into the Rheingold fanfare. Horns high woodwinds stridently and unforgettably launch the distinctive fanfare for the first time in minor mode, together with its world ash interval, which, thanks to the orchestral spread, combine a high ash interval on a heroic rising fifth with a reverse on an equivocal descending air to fourth. Is Albrecht's rape of the Rheingold good, bad, or something of both? A solo trumpet blasts the morpheme's conclusion, necessarily re-emphasizing its ambiguous low ash interval, together with its abandonment triad. Impressively dramatic, this syntax could be written off as a mere flourish, but it's hardly that, crystallizing as it does with that low ash interval on a fifth, juxtaposed with its reverse on an air to fourth, the gold's mighty yet ambivalent power only moments before it's stolen, as well as the rising triad suggesting such betrayals. It's a syntactic gut punch, and for good reason. It echoes across the entire tetralogy. Rising boldly on an air to fourth to mock the gold's light, Albrecht's imprecations move from there through an echoing pair of vocal lines, both on turns resembling his wooing, shaped as chord note reversals, capped by rising minor thirds, the second on a low ash interval. In the rest following each of these two vocals, paler woodwinds sound too harshly diminished seventh fanfare harmonizations, meaning without that klaxon world ash flourish. The last of these announces the dwarf's penultimate cry, his static notes leading to yet another wooing iteration, this time concluded on a major third. His wording must raise an eyebrow, calling the ring Rechenden. While the dwarf has every reason to get his own back on the Rhine Maidens, his general use of the term suggests a vendetta against the entire world, strengthening the idea he's been denied love high and low by whoever he's courted. Once rejected by the nymphs, he shot his last bolt and has no more use for love. The analytic literature is vague about his actual curse, masterfully constructed though it is, from a bundle of pungent syntactic modules heretofore only partially grasped. The ring's initial falling half pointedly sounds the morpheme without its concluding erdem melody notes, in that way stressing its overlapping Welterb triads. This fragment module sounds independently of its complete version throughout the epic. Here, as it announces the dwarf's gauntlet thrown down before nature, it defines its meaning as the weapon of racial conquest he brandishes. Having just linked his words to a broader sort of revenge, Albrecht hurls his malediction against love, not at the nymphs themselves, but die Fluth. 
underpinned with the bassoon's iteration of his prior woe, a module destined to generate the work's most recognizable love syntax. Meanwhile, his vocal moves through static notes to intone a low ash interval, its rising interval reverse chord notes. Albrecht tops this with his actual renunciation of love, howling that he verfluch it. This isn't anything the Rhine maidens tell him he must do, for Voglinde uses the terms entsagt and verjagt. Nor is it a detail from the mythology, where Andvari's ring enters the tale as a fait accompli, its origins unknown. The Nibelung's imprecation again suggests a virulent detestation of love which goes far beyond the Rhine Maiden's cruelty, though they do finally tip it over the edge into its tragic history of violence. Switching to a single measure of duple time to emphasize the morphemic significance, Albarech doesn't sing the entire renunciation morpheme, but only its reverse melody notes and reverse chord notes. He ends on a brutally plunging seventh with its mark of Erda's inspiration, albeit in this case the darkest one possible. He thus produces both a sardonic high ash interval and a double impact, this last apparently chant cell to acquire much syntactic clout, specific to this moment's context. Volzogen notes the presence of renunciation in this example, as do Spencer Millington and Sabor, the last name making rather an interesting comment on its use here. Instead of its usual stepwise descent, it suddenly plunges down by a seventh on the second syllable of Lieber. Albarech's view of love is now distorted, the composer seems to suggest. Given Loge's role as a source of creative ideas, a notion which in time attaches syntactically through the descending seventh to his powers of psychological manipulation, this confirms the fire god's trap closing on the dwarf at Erda's behest. With tubas underlining the harmony on chord notes, this conclusion seems inescapable. Alberich promptly rips the gold from its rocky bed, portrayed orchestrally by the Rheingold fanfare sounded on trumpet, meaning without its introductory low ash interval, a sonic picture of the deed brutally punctuated by two leaping horn woodwind arpeggios and capped with a violent sting across the orchestra, its special bite a crashing cymbal roll held for a dotted semi-brevi. The chord generated by the orchestral sting, held by horns, woodwinds, launches a single wave which surges up to swirl down an unbroken scale, passed from violins to violas, then cellos and bassoons, a sonic picture of the thief's descent and disappearance. At scale's bottom, as an oboe intones a melancholy Welterb triad, capped by Erdachord notes, the dwarf carrying with him his cruel racial urge, as the scale rises back through bassoons, violas, and second violins, to initiate a series of four gradually rising wave pulses in the ring's diminished minor harmonies. Atop these, first Flosshelde and Velgunde, keen static ash intervals capped by falling thirds, Flosshelde's plea to capture the thief with intervening chord notes. Voglinde cries Hilfe on another descending third, leaping up a fifth to join Velgunde on a second pulse, thus creating a ringless strophe. Both unite with Flosshelde on two cries of Ve which rise to follow the minor seventh harmony, Pace Newman, on single and not chord notes. With the Rhine Maiden's last shrillest protest, another wave leaps up its wanted triplet on the violin choir, punctuated by a harsh woodwind horn bass trumpet pedal chord, to again plunge through the other string choirs on an unbroken scale. Once the pedal fades, the final cello wave scale turns back to rise into fingered tremolos, the cello choir divisi in four at their lowest register, atop which the stage directions call for the invisible Albrecht to emit Gelendes Hohngelechter. In the Schulte Vienna premiere recording, Gustav Neidlinger adds a sonorous yet menacing touch by laughing in the Nibelung tattoo rhythm. 
if premature in the work's syntactic evolution, it still makes for an arresting effect when imitated by other recordings and productions, though some take other rhythmic approaches or omit any laugh whatever. It should be noted that, wonderfully charged with mythic flavor as it seems, this entire first Rheingold scene is fabricated out of whole cloth, nothing in the mythology even vaguely resembling it. Albrecht's mythic ancestor, the dwarf Andvari, has no more prehistory than does his magical ring, its only contribution to the Meister's retelling being its power to multiply wealth and the curse it bears. Wagner likely got his inspiration for the underwater gold from Nibelungen lead. There, after murdering Siegfried, Hagen of Tronek throws the treasure, formerly won by his victim from the Nibelungs, into the Rhine in order to hide it. Nor do the Rhine maidens come from the mythology, though another Nibelungen lead episode does portray Hagen's encounter with three Danube water nymphs, who warn him that he and his fellow knights will be killed by Attila, to whose court they journey. This brief episode contributes to the Rhine maiden scene in Goethe Dameron, from which Wagner freely extrapolated his entirely novel opening for the epic as a whole. This is no criticism, since, given Rheingold scene one's wealth of conceptual and psychological detail, one can only marvel at its skill in setting the exact mythological tone while effectively presenting all primary concepts and syntactic germs to be woven through everything which follows. Regarding the scene one two interlude, first of many in this vast work, Cook remarks on the Meister's very specific and quasi cinematic technique, a way of thinking completely unknown in its day, as is true of all his strictly orchestral episodes. The score's verbal instructions describe nothing more than simple lighting effects gradually transforming the scene from black churning water to light clouds as a suggestion of movement from the Rhine's depths to mountain heights. But the syntactic and textural web tells a more detailed story. While Wagner may have been hamstrung by the limited stagecraft of his era, with modern technology this is no longer the case. Despite this, recent productions deliver little of what the music so clearly begs. Some, like Munich in 1989, Copenhagen's 2006 version, Valencia in 2007, and 2012's Teatro Argentino, provide desultory projections, while in 2008, Marinsky approaches the sequence with ballet. Other versions, among them Lucia in 2014 and Vienna in 2016, simply lower the curtain. While this may tacitly accept that discretion is the better part of valor, it does no favors to the work's rich syntactic web. The interlude progresses through three well-defined phases, each with its own uniquely descriptive elements. Following Albrecht's laugh, the first and longest of these takes the form of a great crescendo, followed by its matching day crescendo, all of it preceding the curt transformation instructions, an implication it references events within the Rhine itself. What those might be, producers have always been loath to second-guess and routinely opt for generic visual wallpaper. Yet the passage has a dramatic arc. Cellos unite in a series of four waves, rising in tonic steps over a timpani roll with contrabass tuba low horn pedal, bass clarinet rising in dotted minims outlining the harmony's tonic bones. Once violas join cellos for a single wave, oboes lift in dotted semi brevies on a minor mode arpeggio, which of needs includes the rising triad, with its connotations of abandonment. At this, the pedal chord gives way to more powerful trombone and low woodwinds, which sustain it through the next rising pair of wave pulses, now stronger on viola's second violins, until the violin choir takes over completely with two full pulses. With their second iteration, violins assume the wave's top portion, while viola's cellos sustain the last six semiquavers of its falling line atop two measures of the united horn woodwind pedal chord. When the combination wave lifts in the next measure, another and stronger horn woodwind chord follows suit for another pair of measures. 
Atop the last of these, flutes lift to the interlude's climax, intoning another rising arpeggio and crotchets, which again of needs includes the rising triad. The whole ensemble swelled to frantic intensity, which shifts the diatonic minor mode to diminished seventh, underlined by a sustained pedal chord across woodwinds, horns, and low brasses. After two identical pulses, the wave progressively sinks for another two strophes, over which flutes descend in an elongated statement of the ring fragment. After three more measures of descending waves on violins, completed by violas cellos, the cellos alone take it deep, then rise again as second violin violas fill out its upper curve for one measure, cellos violas on the next, until cellos take it over completely for the next six measures, as if the maelstrom created by Albrecht's theft now gradually quiets. During this long decrescendo, the brass woodwind pedal skillfully trades its pedal point from instrument to instrument, while timpani continue their unbroken roll throughout. The inevitable conclusion is the dwarf's curse on these waters, followed by his theft of the gold, triggers in them some kind of profound trauma, which peaks then subsides. Atop the last four measures of the pedals 3-4 time, under the now distorted waves 9-8, English horn and low woodwinds sustain a mournful pedal, which is in fact an air chord strophe to cap the passage's dreadful underwater maelstrom, syntactic evidence for the dwarf's theft altering the world's physical being. After the last chord, and underpinned by tuba pedal chords and six cello waves, English and French horns mournfully intone renunciation as first heard on Velgunde's lips, meaning both its pulses more or less intact, and as they are punctuated by timpani Valhalla ash intervals. The first half of Renunciation, rising on a pathetic sixth into its reverse melody notes, does omit its initial low ash interval, but the second, for the first time, sounds that interval with its wanted syncopation, exactly as the syntax tends to recur in its limited but crucial iterations across the drama. The morpheme's focus here can only be the nymph's sorrowing response to the catastrophe they've suffered. The texture then shifts to the interlude second and shortest segment, a renunciation echo, that moment when Velgunde explains the magic needed to forge the ring, here as if to picture the dwarf at work on the very task, her vocal line intoned by English horn and two clarinets. The orchestration is nervously peppered by trumpets and timpani in two Valhalla ash interval-like pulses, a static interval interpolated between them, followed by a last Valhalla interval, while the supporting chromatic lines ooze upward on cello middle string tremolos. Second and third clarinets snake up a chromatic triplet quaver scale on the measure's final two beats, a detail to gain importance in scene three. At this point, the interlude's third and last segment begins its gradual evolution of the ring into Valhalla Part One. On Renunciation's heels, an English horn clarinet strophe of the ring proper follows, as if in a cinematic edit, Albrecht now holds his baleful talisman. This initiates a series of three echoing syntactic bundles, during which stage directions at last call for the Rhine's waters to dissolve into mists surrounding the mountaintop where Wotan and Fricka sleep. This first ring strophe floats atop a cello tremolo and arco contrabass pedal, which continues as, in major seventh harmony, first and second violins trade six telescoped waves, which rise gently beneath an ascending crotchet arpeggio on flutes phrased to disguise its triad. Bassoons alone sound the next ring iteration, this time with its harmony softened to major seventh, a timpani roll and horn pedal replacing cello tremolo and contrabasses. Above, violins sketch that rising major arpeggio and crotchets, while flutes trade the series of waves to give a feel of dawn shimmer. 
the third iteration of this bundle timpani roll and horn pedal maintained allots the ring to violas and still gentler harmonies while passing the waves to the glitter of a solo harp the rising arpeggio devolved back to flutes to produce the syntax's most luminously soothing incarnation low strings then take over the pedal for the interlude's coda as two horns intone a pair of ring pulses as they grow softer and slower cellos alone maintain a single pedal note while the horns essentially erase the ring fragment with its already implicit sense of alberich's racial aspirations instead twice rocking back and forth on fifths after which they rise a third then fade on air to melody notes it's a sly hope that Votan's nobler plans enjoy the Earth Mother's benediction. Even so, it's a vain one. And that's all for now. What a cliffhanger. The next video picks up where this one leaves off, the beginning of Rheingold's Scene 2, on page 84 of Dover's Full Score. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there'll be a lot more to come.